Okay, the yucky da, where to start? This is another genuine request for lore, um, which I use in the games and tournaments that I play. The yucky da are basically representative of native inhabitants of planets that are overrun and colonized by the Imperium of Man, specifically for this race, but um, more to draw focus to what happens to all those planets and do they resist? Do they resist the initial conquest or do they get sick of imperial rule and all the wars and rise up at a later date? Um, basically exploring that sort of theme. Once again, I'll apologize. I'm not an artist, so all the um, artwork and shots and stuff don't come from me. They come from the internet and various corners of it. Um, so if it's not a picture of my army directly, it's from somewhere. If it's from you and you don't like it here, just let me know and it'll come down. But I will keep the, uh, once again, keep the specifics, uh, what the army counts as and how what units it uses and all that sort of stuff um, for another video if... Uh, you're interested in that. This one I will stick basically with the lore and read through the fluff as it is at this point. So without further uh, delay, let's get into the Yaki Da Resistance. Early Settlement. Located on the fringes of the Damocles Gulf in the Kimru Sector, the planet Yakid was originally settled by the Imperium in 784 of the 41st millennium. When a colonist ship en route to another sector entirely, emerged from the warp with multiple system failures and found a small, isolated planet, the only inhabitable option in range. Rocky and sandswept, the early reports from your kid indicated a largely desolate planet's surface, dotted sporadically with small oases paradoxically abundant in water and natural resources. These areas were invariably found to be inhabited by the natives of the planet, a humanoid race of long-horned, blue-skinned creatures known in their own tongue as the Yakid, and from whom the planet gets its name. These creatures, although of a peaceful nature and intelligent enough to learn the imperial tongue and engage in open communication with the new settlers, proved singularly uninterested in trade. While technologically inferior compared to the star-travelling Imperials, the early colonists soon realised that not even their advanced machinery or equipment could entice the native inhabitants to bargain. As the months dragged on, and conditions on the desolate planet's surface proved even more dire than anticipated, the colonists prepared themselves for a war of conquest to seize control of the fertile lands of territory inhabited by the Yakid creatures. The Imperial Governor, Eddard declared to colonists and Yakid alike that hostilities were imminent and communications were cut off between the Imperials and the local clans. The Bloodless Wars Within days of the proclamation, the makeshift vanguard of the Imperial Colony's forces rolled into the first of the Yakid villages. What the invaders found, however, ground their offensive to an awkward halt. The Yakid had vanished. It was the same in village after village. The Yakid had simply abandoned their fertile oases and set out in vast caravans across the unforgiving deserts or mountain ranges that made up the majority of the planet's surface. Intoxicated by their unprecedented success and the fertile ground that was theirs, the colonists paid little mind to the Yakid as they left. Turning their endeavors to monopoly and commercial interests, the colonies boomed rapidly with the sheer abundance of pure water, food, and rich seams of mineral wealth just below the surface. Within a few short decades, the once desperate colony on Yakid had turned into a network of industrial powerhouses crisscrossing the surface of much of the planet. The Water Dreamers Over a hundred years would pass before contact was made again with the Yakid people. Much to the surprise, of the Imperial Surveyors, who had been sent in search of suitable sites to be terraformed into hive cities for a booming populace. Even more to their surprise was the fact that the barren lands they had come to survey were now teeming with life and abundance. Communication was reopened with the native tribes that were discovered, who seemed to show no animosity towards the Imperials for their aggressive expansion just a century before. 
One group of surveyors forced to stay in a Yakid village for some time after harsh conditions blocked their route back to their colony soon discovered the secret of the native people's abundance. The ritual that the colonists observed during their time with the Yakid involved every member of the clan. Just outside of their encampment, the majority of the healthy males crisscrossed a flat, barren field in a ritualized dance, powerful hooves carving shallow paths through the clay. Others in the tribe chanted and brayed, beating drums and descending one and all into a kind of trance. As the ritual reached its apex, a tiny droplet of water appeared above the field of dancers. Spinning and swelling, it grew into a sphere many times larger as dark clouds descended from the once clear skies around it. At last, as the chanting lowered into a guttural drone, the sphere burst high above the field, heralding the beginning of a vast rainstorm, drenching the dancers and filling the channels they had dug with their hooves. In this way, barren lands were transformed into lush fields and orchards in a matter of days. These reports revealed to the colonial governors just why the Yakid people had been so reticent about trading for goods in the past, since they were perpetually provided for by the land around them. Later observers of the tribes uncovered other rituals in which the natives manipulated the earth, creating natural dams and drawing rich minerals through the rocks themselves for crafting tools and ornaments. The winds, the earth and the water all seem to answer the call of the Yakid people. Peace and the Mother The following century was a time of peace and mutual growth for the native and imperial settlers. Somewhat idle in their plentiful existence, the Yakid proved to be enthusiastic workers and found themselves readily hired as guides, caravan guards and labourers. Meanwhile, the Imperials found an ally in taming the surface of the planet. So long as the Yakid remained in control of how far and where the colonists could settle, they were willing to share the planet and aid the Imperials in their efforts. Yakid tribesmen soon discovered a taste for Imperial wines, tools and vehicles that lessened the burden of their semi-nomadic existence. Likewise, the strong frame and stout build of the indigenous people, including the women, made them a lucrative workforce for the Imperial. During this period, the relationship between native and colonist intertwined to the extent that imperial cities were soon teeming with Yakid families, and likewise, Yakid villages began to swell with imperial traders and merchants, finally able to offer their wares to an appreciative native market. Wa Gringok. A century of prosperity in such a barren region of space was not to go unnoticed, however, and late. In 892, of the 41st millennium, the orc battlecruiser Lutni chanced into the sector and swiftly fell upon the lightly defended colony. The initial casualties were high as the imperial cities took a pounding from orc orbital bombardments and bomber formations. But it was not until a mutiny on board the ship, led by the scheming orc boss Greengunk, resulted in the Lutni crash landing into the planet's surface that the true battle was to begin. Colonial defences crumbled under the speed of the Orc onslaught, with the peaceful Yakid not being spared the savagery of the Orc deaf companies. Initially resorting to their nomadic caravans, the Yakid were ambushed by the faster speed cults and butchered en masse. Entire clans were lost in a matter of hours. Within months, there was but one imperial colony left standing. But even Glandor, the largest of the Bastion cities, its thick walls towering over the deep valley like a mountain of steel, was being swiftly surrounded. Swollen with refugees, both imperial and native, the final bombardment of the Orcs lasted an entire month. As the closing salvos of the Orc batteries died down, the Imperials made what defences they could in the crumbling walls of their city. The Greenskins, meanwhile, readied themselves to attack up the steep slopes that led to its gates. As the horde gathered speed in its approach, a low droning sound could be heard undulating from the depths of the ruined streets within. Each Yakid, hearing the call of their kin through the rubble and dust themselves took it up, 
until the cacophony of 10,000 voices drowned out the thunderous engines of the approaching orc trucks and stompers. High above the great valley, sinister black clouds coalesced, bursting as one almighty dam over the battle below. Within minutes, thousands of orc vehicles were swallowed up in the sludge or engulfed by stories high mudslides. Within hours, the valley surrounding the city became a raging inland sea. Hundreds of thousands of orcs drowned in the chaos of the ensuing rat. The providential waters lapped at the war-torn palisades of Glandor for many weeks before subsiding, the red-hued sun emerging from the clouds on the spared city below. During that time, the orcs had fallen into disarray and infighting. With this reprieve, the Imperials and native tribesmen rallied and began the campaign to retake their planet. Salvation and Ruin The campaign to reclaim your kid from the Green Menace took several years, during which there were many turns, the most devastating of which came with the revelation of new atrocities committed by the ever-desperate orc tech boys. The circumstances behind the salvation of Glandor, if not fully understood by the orc invaders, had not gone unnoticed. Rumours began early in the campaign to retake Yakid, of orc attempts to uncover the secret of the Yakid's powers. Sometime in the fifth year of the conflict, an overrun orc camp revealed the terrible price that would be paid for the deliverance of Glandor. Among the ruins of the camp were found the tortured remains of several Yakid prisoners, captured and experimented on in the orcs' attempts to harness their power. News of this bred a new level of hatred not before experienced by the placid race, and it is considered this harness rage that was instrumental in the Alliance's final defeat of the last of Green Gunk's boys, holed up in the ruins of the scuttled cruiser just over a year later. The war may have ended, but the Orc Menace is one that is impossible to truly eradicate. Since that time, sporadic fighting has been known to break out between the Yakid tribes and small Orc warbands in frontier regions of the planet's surface. Absolute Power while the conflict against orc invaders dragged on, the restoration of the planet's surface was an entirely different matter. The skill of the Yakid in reshaping the land coupled with the rumours spreading throughout the system of the prosperity of the planet meant that many cities were thriving again even before the final push against the orcs was underway. This time, the population exploded with some 30 million imperial colonists occupying the planet's surface by the year 900. These new arrivals would soon, however, prove another threat, not just to the Yakit, but to the Imperium itself. In the years following the Orc Menace, newly arrived settlers, with little knowledge of the battle-forged alliance between the natives and the Imperium, and little understanding of their ways, soon fell into treating the Yakit as backward and obtuse. Likewise, successive Imperial merchants governors and oligarchs manoeuvred and conspired for control of the riches found so easily on your kid. Vast monopolies and mining empires sprung up. Swathes of land were engulfed into new foundries and mining complexes. Stranger still, the powerful governors seemed less and less interested in their profitable relationship with the natives, and over time, the local clans would find themselves second-class citizens in the cities that once accepted them. Driven off lands that colonists had formerly promised would remain sacred. More disturbing still, rumours had started to spread that some of the Yakid had started to vanish. Day by day, more and more Yakid youths, or fawns as they were known, were disappearing from city streets and villages alike. Fears were raised by the elders, but they fell on deaf imperial ears. Strained tensions turned to violence and paranoia as frightened Yakid lashed out and the Imperial authorities responded with brutality. The Black Horror Not all Imperials had forgotten the close allegiance they owed to the Yakid people during this time. Sympathetic citizens, mostly those living closely with the Yakid, either in the remote villages 
or the poorer districts of the cities, formed networks supporting them with protection and helping to investigate the disappearance of the forms. It was a small band of these Imperial sympathisers that would uncover one of the blackest marks on Imperial history. Infiltrating deep into the confines of the High Governor's own subterranean mining complex, a small group of Imperial women uncovered to their shock a facility with no actual mining equipment to be found. No borers, blasters or trenching vehicles occupied the cavernous underground levels. What they did find, however, was the gravest of betrayals. Clamped to the bare rocks in vast iron chains were the Akid forms, scores of them. The High Governor, along with a secretive conglomerate of powerful oligarchs, had discovered that the Yakid youth, while less able to control their powers, still possessed the same nature-harnessing abilities as the rest of their kin. Using torture to leech raw emotion and vocalizations from the youths, the companies could create endless seams of mineral wealth. Such savage treatment and the exhaustion of such power on bodies so young meant that deaths were a daily inconvenience but nothing could sate the greed of Imperial pockets. The revelation ripped through the colonies on Yukid as the industrial regions doubled down, declaring the natives and their allies enemies of the Imperial, whilst more and more Imperials from the frontiers sided with the Yakid. Eventually, word of the tensions reached the Astartes, with the Salamanders dispatching the battle barge Direforge to investigate. Out in the cold, the Astartes were not expecting the welcome they received. As Captain Whitebrand and his brothers made planetfall on the docking pads in the capital of Glandor, only a small contingent of guardsmen were there to greet them. Before explanation could be offered, a cataclysmic explosion ripped through the entire sector. In all, three gunship transports and over 40 marines, including Captain Whitebrand, were lost along with an unknown number of guardsmen. At the very same moment, warp readings from high orbit heralded the approach of renegade ships. The Diaforge was ambushed and critically disabled in the opening seconds of the exchange. Unable to disengage, a bloody struggle ensued, while on the planet's surface, the taint of chaos was unleashed upon any still loyal to the Emperor. Black-clad marine heretics and shadowy entities materialised among legions of guardsmen companies loyal only to the High Governor. The poor and troublesome districts of the cities were purged of Yakid and Imperial sympathisers alike. Villages were set upon and the caravans once again became sites of mass exterminations. Through sheer will and blind faith, the Battle Brothers in orbit over the planet managed to fight the renegade ships to a standstill. Having lost the momentum of their surprise attack and seeing their boarding actions fail time and again, the heretical fleet disengaged, leaving the Salamanders on board free to pursue their vengeance on the planet below. A running battle was already ongoing down on the surface. Trader companies engaged with an increasingly organised Yakid resistance clashing both inside and outside the cities. On the brink of collapse, the Yakid clans and their allies welcomed the arrival of the Astartes, who with surgical strikes from orbit, quickly evened out the fight. However, for the natives, this would be a temporary respite. The Salamanders, already at task purging the High Governor and his heretics, had little sympathy for the Yakid. At best, they found them faithless Xenos, at worst, their unusual appearance was taken to be a sign of the corrupting influence of chaos. The Yakid found themselves alone once again, attacked by the genocidal heretics and abandoned by the single-minded Astartes. With only the makeshift weapons and vehicles they could salvage from the battlefields, the Yakid resistance soon deteriorated from fighting pitch battles and open street warfare to minor strikes aimed at disrupting the heretical legions. After two years, the Salamanders finally broke the back of the trader forces, but this was too little, too late for the Yakid, who slowly vanished as numbers and supporters dwindled. 
The conflict would also usher in the re-emergence of Orc invaders, as the heretic hordes kept the Astartes and Loyalists busy. Yakid lands surrounding the ancient Orc hulk were overrun by battle-hungry greenskins. The war had proven as destructive as it was inconclusive. The salamanders, although victorious, lacked the numbers to completely purge the population. Their chapter being called to another conflict in the Cadian sector, they left a single company with the new imperial commanders to oversee the hunt for further renegades and shore up the planet's defences against the resurgent orcs. The once prosperous peace of Yaqid was replaced with martial law, food shortages and daily privations. The devastation of war and the disappearance of the Yaqid clans making life tough for the remnants of the imperial colonies. Rebirth and resistance. It was over half a century before the Yaqid would re-emerge from obscurity. The first sightings came in the form of intelligence reports from imperial engagements inside Orc territories. In the heat of a violent firefight, native warriors would suddenly appear, engaging in small but devastating strikes against their Orc foes. Random instances of Yaqid engagements would soon transform into widespread, coordinated attacks on key areas across the planet, crippling Orc and Renegade convoys or targeting important strongpoints. But these were not the Yaqid of centuries past. Years of war and persecution had moulded the once peaceful tribes into highly skilled and tenacious fighters. With little more than scrapped together vehicles and looted weapons, the Yaqid clans utilised animal-like cunning to spring traps on forces three times their number, devastating their opponents before withdrawing to the surrounding wilderness. Disturbing reports also suggested that the Yaqid were now capable of warfare of a whole new nature. Information from early encounters with the numerically inferior Yaqid had revealed an alarming set of coincidences. In the hours or even days before the Yaqid would strike, there were inevitably a series of anomalous weather disturbances. In an Astartes raid on a renegade stronghold in the Partmouth sector, Salamander and Imperial companies were awaiting heavy siege-breaking equipment to tackle the stout walls of the fortress when a sudden earthquake struck the region. Walls crumbled and a key barracks was flattened inside the fortress, while Imperials outside heard an eruption of small arms fire within the complex. Seizing the initiative, the Astartes and Imperials swarmed into the fortress to find the heretic defenders already engaged in a confused and desperate battle with Yaqid raiders that had emerged from out of the rubble. In a similar incident, Imperial scouts monitoring an orc speed cult harassing their frontier region were caught in a torrential downpour that lasted 24 hours. The scouts set out in the clearing weather to discover the orc camp in ruins. Unable to move their bogged vehicles, the orcs were set upon sometime during the night by a Yaqid raiding party. The orcs were slaughtered to the last and the camp looted before the Yaqid again vanished into the storm. Stories like these have become more and more frequent on the planet, and the psychological strain on those who call them enemy is palpable, with every change in the weather becoming a precursor to panic and paranoia. And the Yaqid have not forgotten the betrayals of man. Their objective, by all accounts, is the reclaiming of their planet, as the speed and precision of their early attacks began to show progress, it was noted that large swathes of Orc and Renegade lands had been reclaimed by the native inhabitants and villages began to reappear once more on the sacred plains. The savagery of the Orcs and treachery of the Renegades meant that these factions earned the majority of the Yaqid's ire in the early months. But more and more frequently, Imperial settlements, heedlessly encroaching on the Yaqid lands, have met with the same fate. Despite this, the Yaqid frequently coordinate their attacks on heretics and orcs to coincide with the Astartes or Imperial offensives. Even so, the Salamander's patience for the disruptions of the Yaqid and their sympathisers has long since run out. Dotted over the planet's surface, scores of isolation camps have sprung into being. High walls and secretive Imperial and Astartes overseers 
determined to lock down the resistance. Increasingly determined raids against these facilities, along with ever more territory being reclaimed by the Yaqid in each season, sends a clear message to all occupiers. Yaqid is their homeworld. The time of imperial rule is at an end. The Dragfar Rebellion. On the battlefield, the presence of a Yaqid raiding force is usually heralded by the guttural braze of Yaqidar, roughly translated as Yaqid Free in the imperial tongue. Rumours are spreading, however, that the battlefields of Yaqid are not the only place one can find the embers of this native resistance. Stowed away in the cargo bays of imperial merchant ships and incubated in the taverns and alleyways of an ever-growing number of worlds, rumours of strange-looking outsiders appearing and preaching a new kind of order among the stars. Heretical preachings that tell of a future without the Imperium, or any of the vast empires of the galaxy. Native worlds ruled by native worlders. There are even more disturbing reports of something known as the Dragfar Rebellion. The orders of the Inquisition and Adeptus Arbites are tight-lipped about such matters. But know the right people in the right corners of the most ill-reputed establishments of the most wretched hives and one can always prize open a few stories with a few good drinks. There is one, a herald, a saviour, perhaps simply a legend, the brainchild of a gifted orator, but many are convinced that this Yaqid walks amongst us, travelling the galaxy in secret, rallying the natives of a thousand worlds, and when the time is right, they will set fire to the stars. A thousand rebellions on a thousand worlds. No great chaos invasion under the auspices of the dark gods. No coordinated expansion for the greater good. A thousand billion souls rising up and taking back the souls of their planets. A confederation of conspirators that will burn the scourge of empires from the stars and replace them with a confederation of liberated worlds and liberated minds, and the whispers grow louder with each passing day.